Hello and welcome. Uh, we are thriving together here in Beverly, Massachusetts, under the auspices of the Council on Aging. Uh, my name is Susan Crowley, and I'm, uh, you know, your host today. And I have with me Nancy Kendrick, who is a trained end-of-life doula. So we are going to be talking about exactly what that is, and uh, a little bit about end-of-life and how that sits with people. <laughs> so uh, let's begin. And you know, the first question always, I think, on everybody's mind is. You know, they've heard of, you know, uh, birthing doulas, but end-of-life doulas, maybe not so much. So let's just start there. Nancy. All right. Great. Thanks, Susan, and I'm um, happy to be here. Um, yeah, so there are a lot of analogies with birth doulas and end-of-life doulas, and um, a lot of people think it's kind of the bookends of, huh. um, of a <laughs> life and the same kind of preparation and support, um, both emotional and physical, that's helpful at birth can also be helpful at death. So um, an end-of-life doula is just someone who's going to help people, both um, individuals and families, prepare for that time. And then what about um, hospice then and how, how, how do you work with hospice or differ from hospice? Yeah, good question. A lot of people um, are curious about that. And um, I think the most important thing to know is that there's um, no conflict between end-of-life doulas and hospice work. And in fact, there's quite a bit of overlap. Mm. Um, and most end-of-life doulas want and welcome their um, patients um, working with hospice because there are some really key differences. Mm -hmm. um, one of the main differences is that end-of-life doulas are not medically trained, and so we are not um, there to give medical support. And at the end of life, um, that is mm -hmm. kind of hospice's sweet spot and, and what is so needed and welcomed by families. So um, that's one big difference. Another difference is that um, hospices are regulated by um, Medicare regulations, so there are some requirements. And one of the requirements is that a person has to have a diagnosis of six months or less to live, and also that they have to be not receiving any curative treatment at the point that they go into hospice. Um, and that makes a lot of sense from mm -hmm. a hospice perspective. But a lot of the things um, that can be done regarding planning for end of life um, can be done much sooner. And in fact, people don't need a terminal diagnosis at all, mm -hmm. or um, they may have a terminal diagnosis but still be receiving um, curative treatments, and yet at the same time they want to begin to think about and prepare mm -hmm. for um, th their end of life. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm thinking, you know, if you just want to if you're anxious about it and you just mm -hmm. want to talk about it, an end-of-life doula would be somebody who, you know, you could talk with when other people maybe are a little bit more not wanting to do that, or family, yeah. you know, yeah, maybe. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and again, um, I mean, one of the things that drew me to the, uh, the field is that there's a really wide range of things that end-of-life doulas can provide. And, um, and some are very specific projects or activities, but others are just um, providing um, that emotional support and, mm -hmm. and talking um, mm -hmm. and being a listening ear to someone. Mm -hmm. So um, that, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, how did you, um, how long have you been a trained end-of-life doula, and how did you get into it? Yeah, I was trained in 2020, right smack in the middle of COVID. That's a good time. That's a good time to kind of do some kind of a training or something. Yeah. Like well, that. it was it was clearly a period to reevaluate what I was doing. Um, I, I um, had been uh, working part time at the time, but the nature of my work um, was affected by COVID, and I was kind of um, at home wondering kind of what the next step would be. And of course, we were surrounded by all kinds of stories of people dying during COVID uh -huh. and dying in unplanned and unexpected ways and without, and without family, family and, and support. And um, so that was, you know, definitely in my periphery. And, um, and I began to really evaluate and think about what 
how do I want to spend the rest of my life? Mm -hmm. And um, I really felt drawn to it and um, did some research and was able to do the training during COVID. So, mm -hmm. um, so it worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. Well, good. What, um, what, what in your background also led mm -hmm. up to that point, I'm wondering? Well, you know, I, I, what, I, I often think about that um, I, I honestly don't remember a time when I didn't, um, wasn't exposed to death growing up. And, you know, I really attribute it to, I was, I was raised in a large extended family. We had a neighborhood that was full of people and friends and families. And um, a lot of older relatives, a lot of um, what I call out of order deaths where young fathers uh -huh. were, um, had died and leaving wives and families. And so I just was always drawn into, you know, those, those uh -huh. e events and activities. And, um, I saw a lots of people, but particularly my parents, um, they, they leaned in and they, they supported people in their death and grieving uh -huh. when other people were hesitant and would pull back. And uh -huh. um, so I, I feel I had really good role models of mm -hmm. that, you know, death is a part of life and we're part of communities and this is what we can do for one another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, I've read a few things about how so many people aren't exposed anymore that mm -hmm. years ago, people who were older, who needed, you know, assistance were in the home and right. families. Yep neighbors took care of them and now they're kind of often shuffled off into a long-term care facility and yeah. so they're not so uh, the process of getting older and dying isn't so uh present right in neighborhoods yes as it used exactly to be. i think yeah for a lot of people it's not it's not as visible um and i i do think the trend is a little bit turning um, in the sense that, um, again, I'll make the parallel to the, the birth doula movement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was a time when women gave birth and um, partners and husbands were not allowed in the delivery room uh -huh. and medications and, yeah, and all that. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. and there became kind of an advocacy um, movement along the birth. And I see that a little bit uh -huh. um, starting to happen with, with end of life and people really saying, I do want more autonomy. I want more control. I want more decisions. Um, and um, I mean, I just read recently, I mean, it's over 90% of the people will say they would like to die at home, mm -hmm. surrounded by loved men in their own home. And yet a very small percentage of people actually end up having that experience. Uh -huh. um, but I did see a hopeful statistics recently that it's beginning to to creep up a little and and it, I think it's really related to um, a lot of hospice work that can be hospice mm -hmm. services can be provided in the home and um, so I, I do see a, a, a somewhat mm -hmm. of a shift mm -hmm. I'm encouraged by that yeah and I'm thinking that in is this in your wheelhouse you know if somebody wants to talk with their family about the fact you know mm -hmm. that they're aging that they're gonna yeah. die but their family really Oh, Ma, no, I, you know, we don't need to go there. Yeah. Is that something that's kind of in your wheelhouse, you know, yes. to help people talk about their families and how best to approach that subject? Right, yes, and, and it, it really happens both ways. Yeah. I, mean, yeah. I, mean, oh, yeah. I mean, you know, it can be older um, people who um, find that their children are reluctant to talk about it, and it's like, Mom, don't bring up that. It's like, yeah. I'm not ready. Um, and, and vice versa, where the kids are saying, like, I have no idea what my parents want. I don't know mm. how to bring it up to them. So there are lots of resources, and certainly an end-of-life doula can provide those. Um, but th there are also um, some good tools. Mm -hmm. There's um, uh, an organization called the Conversation Project um, that's online that um, gives families tips. Mm -hmm. And then um, there is a toolkit called Five Wishes I've that can that. help yeah. people um, start conversations and really think through and and, um, and uh, mm. identify what their wishes are. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you've been doing this for several years mm -hmm. now. Um, are there any surprises that you've had as you uh, meet with people mm -hmm. or connect with people related to dying or... Uh, 
new things that you hadn't thought about or what, you know, yeah. kind of challenges? <laughs> or? Well, yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that, w that I was initially, um, again, pleasantly surprised with, and I, I think it's the nature of people who seek me out or seek out end-of-life doulas um, tend to be more open to the conversation because um, I have found when given the right environment and asked the right questions, most people really want to talk about these things. They uh -huh. may not be comfortable talking about it with their families and friends uh -huh. and in social settings, but, you know, one-on-one, -on -one, people do think about their end uh -huh. of life, and, uh -huh. um, and most people really want to talk about it and uh -huh. find comfort when they do. Uh -huh. so. uh -huh. You know, I, I have to bring out this quote <laughs> that I wrote down. I didn't know if I was going to be able to use it or not, but... Uh, Irv Yalom is a psychiatrist mm -hmm. out of Stanford, and one of the thing, one of his pieces of advice is, I, I wrote it, to become wise, you must learn to listen to the wild dogs barking in your cellar. <laughs> you know, and I think we could ask anybody, what, what does that, what might that mean? What wild dogs do we have? Bar you know, and I'm thinking, yeah. well, these are those things that turn around inside of us that maybe we look at or maybe we avoid. Right. You know, and uh, to look at them, you know, right. and, you know, kind of, uh, massage them around a little bit instead of denying, you know, that you're dying or whatever. Um, yeah, I think that's, that's to wisdom. Yeah. Because the fact is that I think, you know, the more that you can uh, connect up, and I, and I think uh, the listeners, if they've s seen any of my interviews previously, you know, I'm a trained leader, you know, in mm -hmm. uh, for Saging International, mm -hmm. and we look at conscious aging. And one of the things mm -hmm. in that program is, uh, you know, coming to terms and understanding, you know, mortality, mm -hmm. uh, and that the more that you can kind of look at it, the better off you are. In some, you know, in 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 circumstances, and it's probably going to vary for everybody, but boy, it sure helps you realize how precious life is. Yes, exactly. And, you, you know, I mean, it's almost trite to say this, but death is one of the very few, if not the only thing in life, that there's absolute certainty, <laughs> certainty about. <laughs> and so um, it is this irony that um, we do so much to avoid thinking about it um, when it, it is going to happen. And, um, and we've got evidence that the more we're prepared for it, the, um, the kind of, um, I, I saw a term recently describing um, end-of-life doulas in, in this way, and I loved it. It's like um, trying to um, make the process gentler. You know, we don't know, we can't predict how we're going to die, we can't predict how it's going to unfold, but, um, you know, with planning and with assistance from and support from mm -hmm. other people, um, you know, the goal is to make it a gentler process. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, that, that sounds good. I'm thinking of another, I think a social psychologist, uh, Ernest Becker, his book is called The Denial of Death. Mm -hmm. You know, and he says death anxiety is behind so many of our anxieties and fears. Mm -hmm. You know, that um, another point to, you know, kind of uh, listening to the dogs. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Good. Um, so, you know, when, when I first started thinking about mortality, you know, when mm -hmm. I was in this program during mm -hmm. COVID, um, you know, my biggest fear at that time was um, loss of independence mm -hmm. and uh, uh, not being able to do, you know, what I wanted to do and, and all of those things. And as I got more into it, well, it was very reassuring to hear that, you know, that really is a number one concern of about everybody. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, but, it, you know, I could I could say that about, you know, my life now. I'm seven, I'm 70, almost 74. Mm -hmm. I have almost 74 years of life expectant, <laughs> of life, what is that, life experience. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. what we say in saging. Yeah. You don't just introduce how old you are, but 
life experience yeah. because mm -hmm. that says you've been around, yeah. you know, and uh -huh. there's, you know, stuff that you can think about and talk about that, you know, um, uh, is valuable mm -hmm. for yourself for sure. and, and, for sure. and, and for other and for other people. So uh, that appreciation of life and uh, the fact that everybody worries about that. What are what are other things that you're aware of that are concerns for people that? Well, a, a, a lot of people, it's, it's connected to that loss of autonomy, but um, it's specifically that they don't want to be a burden on other people. Um, I mean, that is really um, paramount. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and I've had multiple cases where I'll be with spouses and there'll be um, one person will be saying, I I just want this to end quickly. I, I you know, I, I see what it's doing to my mm -hmm. spouse, and I know they're tired, and I know they're, I, it's hard for them, and I just want to go quickly. And I'll look at the spouse, and the spouse will say, I will do this for the next 20 years yeah, <laughs> to yeah. have the time. You know, we still can have dinner together. Uh -huh. We still are telling stories. Don't you worry about, um, you know, uh -huh. how tired I am or whatever. Um, I, you know, I want to do this. So, you know, again, it's, it's just that um, yeah. dichotomy. That, yeah, yeah. And I imagine that, well, I'm thinking of a, of a friend uh, whose husband has Alzheimer's. It mm -hmm. sure takes a toll. Yes. Even, you know, caregivers, there's a lot written about right. the stress, you know, caregivers and, and all that. But yes. Boy, it's a yes. difficult thing. What other kinds of things are people concerned about? Um, well, I, I'll, I'll get to that, but uh, since you mentioned caregivers, I mean, I will say that's also an area where um, end-of-life doulas um, and, and hospice as well can provide some some help. Um, one of the um, things that um, that I do is respite care, and uh -huh. so mm. you know, if a family member just needs time, I mean, in many cases, people are still trying to work either part time or full time, or they, um, you know, ha need a nap, or they need and want to get some exercise, mm -hmm. or doctor's appointments for themselves, and all these things, and. Um, you know, mm -hmm. sometimes family and friends are there to supplement, but e even with those, an end-of-life doula can kind of be the liaison and the manager uh -huh. of the uh -huh. um, uh, uh -huh. the the needs of the family and kind of kind of coordinate that mm -hmm. that that care. To be connected to you know, so that anybody in the family can bring out their worries or concerns. Because I imagine, right. like as you mentioned, the husband and wife are. There are different concerns with yeah. all of right. the different family members. Yes, perhaps. exactly, exactly. Yeah, I had um, a, a, pa a spouse who had lost his wife, and um, he had come across um, a card that his daughter had given his wife while she was ill, and it said you know, you are my best friend. And he said it kind of hit him like a ton of bricks because mm -hmm. he had been so caught up in his own grief. He said, I, j I realized my poor children were also grieving mm -hmm. and, um, and I re really probably haven't been as sensitive to them as, as I could uh -huh. be. So, uh -huh. yes, everybody is feeling yeah. different things. Everybody's experience is different. Yeah, um, yeah. And you hear about... Uh, families or people who fall apart after the death of someone significant, right? yes. especially I'm thinking if it was a child, yes. you know, yes. you, you read about that. Yes, exactly, yes. Um, and that's where um, just the recognition that everybody grieves in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, again, you, you talked about with my background, but where, where I first became aware of that was when my my father died, and I have three sisters. And I just realized we were on different timetables. We missed and grieved different th things, and we grieved in different ways. And what worked for one of us was like 
kind of um, shocking to <laughs> some of the others of us. Uh -huh. and, you know, you, it, it takes a tremendous amount of, um, of what I call grace and just um, acceptance to kind of let people go on their own path at their own timetable. Yeah, and that there isn't a right or wrong no, and to weather all exactly. those differences. Exactly. Yeah, well, that's a growing experience in and of itself right there. Yes. You know, yeah. to, to yeah. be able to do that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what else? Yeah. Well, um, I think one of the things that um, is important is that end of life doulas. There, there's a wide range of activities that, that people, and some, some is um, you know so along the lines we've talked about, kind of the emotional mm -hmm. and planning preparations. But you know, sometimes people are thinking about and um, concerned with. Um, you know, either members of their families or um, future generations, or wa wanting to like, how will I be remembered? Oh, there you go. What? Um, how do I want to be remembered? <laughs> how how will I be remembered? And there are some lots of really, especially today with all technology, there's lots of really some very creative things that people can do mm -hmm. um, if they want to. Um, mm -hmm. um, make plans um, mm -hmm. to prepare and and. Um, some of it, again, um, it has to do with projects where it might be videos or writing letters to either current grandchildren or future grandchildren mm -hmm. to be read at different milestones um, or, or different activities. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, so, so there's lots of different activities. And, um, I mean, one that, one that just came to mind because, I, again, when I'm working with people, I am um, very interested in how do they want to spend whatever time they have left, uh -huh. and um, so looking at you know what what either goals or activities or things that they have, and um, and I <coughs> sorry I saw um, a video of a um, of a mother who literally her son was maybe eighteen, not anywhere close to being married, didn't have a girlfriend. But she knew she was terminally ill. She knew she would not live to see him get married. And she f said, the thing I'm going to miss the most is a mother-son dance at a wedding. And so they did it. <laughs> you know, they picked out a song. They got dressed up. They had someone videotape them. And, you know, they, they had that experience, which mm -hmm. they'll both carry with them, you yeah. know. So, um, so there's just lots of things that if people have either anticipated regrets or, uh -huh. you know, um, goals that that you can kind of work to help uh -huh. people uh -huh. fulfill. Uh -huh. Oh, that's a that that choked me up a bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, it did. Um, it did well, me as well. That's, yeah, potent. Uh, yeah. In uh, you know, in the saging world. Um, you know, one of the things that we talk about in terms of legacy is, you know, you, you can leave a le legacy. You know, some of those more concrete things, yeah. like, you know, my son has asked me for recipes. Yes. Uh -huh. You know, and, uh, you know, there are different autobiographical, all kinds of yeah. things out there that you can do. But it's also just about who you are day to day mm -hmm. that you, you're leaving, you know, and... Yep. Uh, and uh, how people uh, will remember you. And... How you how you met death, mm -hmm. yes. how you die, yes. you know, is a you know it's a legacy. Yes, you know that yes. can, you know, make people more comfortable with the pro your family or friends more comfortable with the pro process or not. Yes, yes, exactly, exactly. Um, again, personal experience. The the day my father started chemotherapy. Um, he said to people in the room, um, of course, I would like to live, but if I can't, I want to teach you how to die. Mm -hmm. And he verbalized it. Um, and that is kind of was top of mind for him as he uh -huh. went through his last few months. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, that's, that's special. Mm -hmm. You know, that's great because it is, I mean, it's a difficult topic that people can shy away from, yeah. uh, but yeah. uh, meeting it, I think, I don't know anybody who hasn't, uh, 
you know, met that experience, and I guess I'm talking about myself, mm -hmm. and not been, uh, feel fortunate to have struggled with it and kind of come a little bit closer to terms with it, even to thinking about, yeah, how do I want to die? Mm -hmm. You know, how, yeah. what, what would I want my last days to be full of? What is a good yes. day, you know, yeah. for me when, you know, maybe I'm bedridden or, or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And yep. what counts, and I have a list of things. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, and what, and, you know, what I have helped people do is talk about those things and actually document them and, and write them down so that, whoever is with you at that time knows if there's songs you would like to be listening uh -huh. to, is there a certain environment you'd like, um, you know, some people envision, you know, warmth and comfort mm -hmm. and dark spaces and peaceful, others, you know, want the windows wide open and sunlight coming in uh -huh. and, you know, all kinds of uh -huh. friends and family in and out and, yeah. you know, so, but, you know, when given the opportunity to kind of imagine what that would be like, um, most people have some ideas about mm -hmm. what they would want. Mm -hmm. And it's very mm -hmm. helpful for family to kind of know that. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. I, can, I can definitely see that. Mm -hmm. Well, gee, we're winding down our time <laughs> pretty fast. That's yeah. delightful. So how, um, if somebody wanted to get uh, in touch with an end of life doula. What, what's how? How do they go about finding someone? Or yeah, that? well, there okay. are, um, the, you know, like like a lot of things, um, there are some national organizations um, that, and I mean, the best starting point is, of course, word of mouth. If you know people or friends or family that have um, worked with somebody, um, but there also you can Google it, and there will be local resources and directories um, that will mm -hmm. um, come up and. When and I, so they would Google end of, of life, life doula. doula. Yeah, yeah. Um, the other thing is, and people, um, you know, sometimes call the uh, other words. I mean, sometimes people use the word death doula or um, guides or guide. Uh, you know, different. Well, oh, I different noticed words. your your website actually is. It's what is it? It's m well, my website is the name of it is. Um, death journey guidance. Death journey guidance. And um, it's really a personal preference in terms of yeah, the, the yeah, name someone yeah. uses. But I, I prefer end of life doula because I do think it um, expands a broader period of time than just the actual death. And, yeah. and um, you know, we touched on it earlier. I mean, it can be someone who just wants to get some documents in place and some mm -hmm. thoughts um, mm -hmm. before they even. Mm -hmm. um, have a any kind of medical issue, or at find all. that they're preoccupied yeah. with it. Yeah, you know, exactly. Unnecessarily, you know. I <laughs> right. mean, just in terms of age, of anyway. Yeah, yeah. Just you know? so, um, so I I use the term end of life doula, but um, but the other thing I always say to people is it you know it's like any vendor or person that you would work with that you you want to meet people you might want to talk to more than one person get a feel for what they offer what they don't offer and really make sure that there's good um, rapport and good chemistry between mm -hmm. between you because um, these are intimate discussions they're intimate mm -hmm. um, times and you want to be comfortable with whoever yeah. you're, you're working yeah. with um, so and then the other thing I would say is there's a range of things that people can offer, and some people specialize in two or three things, and other people are more general in terms of what they offer. So okay. you just want to make sure that you know whatever you're looking for, the person offers. Okay, <laughs> we got a countdown, seven <laughs> seconds. So hey, thank you for look for uh, checking in with us, and thank you, Nancy. That was super. Oh, thank you. I had um, <laughs> fun talking about um, yeah. the topic with you. And okay. Well, maybe we'll do it again sometime. Right. <laughs> All right. Bye. <laughs>